thank you guys for your patience, Dr. Thomas. We had an excellent business. Uh, the history of this, uh, county manager contacted me two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever it was, and said that Dr. Thomas had requested a meeting with our two boards. And uh, in pitching that to our board, uh, we decided to do a continuation meeting of our last meeting and invite your board to join. So welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, I thank all your board members here. Mr. Bell is the uh, chairman of that board. Do you have anything to, to share? Okay, Dr. Thomas. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished <coughs> commissioners. Um, as you recall, back in December, we had uh, presented at the commissioner's meeting a fairly detailed and lengthy um, presentation on the Macon County Master Plan. Um, probably my passion starts to run deep and I get excited about what we do, but uh, I'm going to try to make this one a lot quicker this evening and do more of a review and then we will move into a, a request uh, 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 to approve kind of and work toward a master plan in Macon County. First of all, though, um, as Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, Mr. Bell is here as chairman of our board. We have Mr. Holt, who is our vice chairman, Conrad Durrell. Mr. Burrell is a uh, member of board of trustees. We have Mr. Sutton, who public safety and training uh, complex is named after. And then we have Mr. Gary Shields and Mr. Jim Kluwer. Uh, we have Dr. Cheryl Davis, dean of the Macon campus. We have Curtis Dowell, dean of our uh, public safety and training. Nan Coulter, executive administrative assistant, Doreen Castle, business officer and computer tech for me. Also, and then Mike Watson is here uh, with Flowers Allison Watson, who worked on the master plan developing it for us. Um, if I could take um, I have a short video that's about nine minutes, um, and, and I think it's, it, I don't think, I know it's pertinent to what we're discussing here this evening. Uh, this is a, important uh, for us in Macon County for the future of the uh, residents and the growth of our campus and, and then just the growth of the educational services. So. Education is core to our economy. But in order to guide our educational systems and maximize future income, we must understand the hear that? between no. <coughs> and our community. In my pursuit of higher education, I have earned two bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, and I'm working on a PhD. In total, this has cost me over $150,000. I've done all this because I believe formal education is important. Part of this belief came from seeing charts like this presenting a correlation between higher degrees and higher income, showing on average that a person with a college degree earns far more money than the average person without a high school diploma. This perceived higher earning for having a four-year degree has fueled a college for all philosophy, causing educators and parents to encourage going to the university, any university, to major in anything in pursuit of future job security, social mobility, and financial prosperity. This philosophy has increased college enrollment, resulting in 66% of high school graduates in this country enrolling in higher education right after high school. That's two out of three. Initially, they are deemed the successful ones. But what you won't see advertised is the reality that most drop out, and only a quarter of those that enroll will finish a bachelor's degree. Only after these few graduate do many of them start exploring careers. It is here that they discover that their degree may not have prepared them for the world of work. You may be well educated, but not every degree is direct preparation or employment. This misalignment between degrees and job skills causes half of university graduates to be underemployed in what are called gray collar jobs, taking positions that do not require the education they have received and the cost that is more than they can afford. Conventional wisdom suggests that a university degree guarantees a higher salary, but with rising education costs, a shrinking job market, and the oversaturation of some academic majors in the workforce, this old advice is now a myth for a majority of students. The economy and the world have dramatically changed. Over the last three generations, we've gone from 13% of the population stepping into a college classroom to 60% attending some form of higher education. In 1960, when taking into account all jobs in the American economy, 20% required a four-year degree or higher, 20% were technical jobs requiring skilled training, and 60% were classified as unskilled. But what's the right percentage to meet the labor market demand for tomorrow? In 2018, 
Harvard University predicts only 33% of all jobs will require a four-year degree or more, while the overwhelming majority will be middle-skilled jobs requiring technical skills and training at the credential or associate degree level. A four-year degree may have many benefits, but think about the people you know who, from an economic perspective, inefficiently spend time and money to get a degree that perhaps they didn't really need for the career they are in. The true ratio of jobs in our economy is one, two, seven. For every occupation that requires a master's degree or more, two professional jobs require a university degree, and there are over half a dozen jobs requiring a one-year certificate or two-year degree. And each of these technicians are in very high-skilled areas that are in great demand. This ratio is fundamental to all industries. It was the same in 1950, the same in 1990, and will be the same in 2030. The hope for encouraging university education is that as the number of university-trained workers increases, the demand for their services in the workplace will increase as well. Unfortunately, this is not so. The whole pie may get bigger as the labor force and the economy grows, but the ratio will not change. The reality is, there will not be more professional jobs available within the labor market. And some professional jobs have been replaced by technology or are being outsourced. Well-intentioned attempts to send more and more students straight to the university will not change the types of jobs that dominate our economy, nor will a college-for-all mentality mask these labor market realities. The college-for-all rhetoric that has been so much a part of the current education reform movement is often interpreted as university-for-all. This message needs to be significantly brought to a post-high school credential-for-all. Students at various educational levels have left school without employable skills, setting up our children for failure, costing them and taxpayers millions. All while the labor market is desperate for highly trained, skilled technicians. So how do you position yourself for high-wage, in-demand jobs? Let's say you were considering a career as either an electrician or a business manager. You would find that the average annual income for electricians is 51000 only about half of the 105,000 average wage for management occupations. So at first glance, it looks as if getting a bachelor's degree in business is a no-brainer, but adding skills and ability into the picture adds a whole new dynamic. What if you have the potential to become an excellent electrician, but lack the skills and ability to be an excellent manager? Then you should be looking at projected incomes towards the bottom of the pay scale for managers and towards the top for electricians. You would then discover that electricians near the top of the pay scale make around 86,000, far higher than the income of a manager near the bottom of the pay scale of 52,000. Now this is just one example, but the concept is true throughout all industries. The claim that you will make more money with an increased amount of education is not necessarily inaccurate, it's just incomplete. That advice is based just on the average, but no one is perfectly average. Everyone has unique skills, talents, and interests. In fact, the income for the top individuals in a wide variety of skilled jobs that require an industry credential or two-year degree is far higher than the average income for many occupations that require a four-year degree. Nationally, associate degree earners range between $27,000 and $68,000, while bachelor's recipients earn between $34,000 and $97,000. But this data only accounts for the 25th to the 75th percentile of full-time adult workers. This means that 25% of associate degree holders earn more than $68,000 annually, and 25% of bachelor's degree holders earn less than $34,000. Our world has changed, and in this new economy, the university degree is no longer the guaranteed path towards financial success as it was for previous generations. And even if you do earn one, that education alone may not be enough. In today's highly technical, knowledge-based economy, having hands-on skills and perfecting what you're good at can be more valuable than getting a degree in something simply to get one. Employers want to know what you can do and what you can do well, not just what degree hangs on your wall. Since new and emerging occupations in every industry now require a combination of academic knowledge and technical ability, we need to ensure that we're also guiding students towards careers and not just to the university. So before enrolling in classes or deciding what you're going to do next in your life, step one is self-exploration. In addition to your interests, really analyze your talents and strengths. Step two is career exploration. Understand the jobs available, the income ranges they pay, and evaluate the skills they require. Identifying an area that appeals to your interests, skills, and the labor market may be your first career. And then you can develop a tentative career plan complete with multiple training and education. This alignment 
will help bring your future into focus and ensure your position at the top of the pay scale in your chosen career. What all this data shows is that success in the new economy is as much about acquiring the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed for in-demand occupations as it is to be well-educated. Both paths may work for you, but education combined with technical training is how you ultimately secure a competitive advantage in the new economy. Community colleges are in an ideal position to provide over 70% of tomorrow's workforce with an education combined with applied technical skills, industry-driven credentials, and specific preparation for employment. Being a skilled craftsman or technician is highly valued. Investments in career education programs at high schools and community colleges will help all students obtain an education which includes technical training and preparation for the workplace. Ultimately, this is how all students can be successful. In the new economy, both education and technical skills are the new currency. Will you be ready? As we talk about a master plan and an opportunity to expand and make the county, I think when watching that video, what hits home is that community colleges produce 70% of the graduates that will be taking the jobs in the future. Um, so they're going to need that <coughs> industrial credential, the associate degree, or a diploma. Um, and so I just felt that, you know, that's a new video that just came out from uh, MC that they do economic impact studies throughout the country. And so this is a new release that they provided to us. Um, and now, just real quick overview of what we did back in December. We talked about the increase uh, of what is happening here in Macon County, 74.4% increase over a six year period, uh, approximately 12% increase per year. That's our curriculum enrollment, and that's what uh, uh, Dr. Davis can speak to. Uh, the public safety and training that Curtis uh, can speak to again is at 73% over a six year period. Again, it's 12%. Uh, it may even be higher than that this year with uh, some of the programs that he's at, uh, running at this point. Um, the enrollment uh, has been a 36% increase over a five year period. I think uh, Dr. Davids will mention to you that they broke 500 last fall. Uh, we're again about um, seven to eight percent above this spring over last spring. Uh, Again, just 90% of our grads stay in the area that go back to the 70% of the grads that will be looking for training to get 7% of those jobs. Um, not over 90% of the uh, emergency medical personnel, uh, law enforcement. We do a lot of first responders is what you, that you know of. And these are people that are uh, service oriented and help and provide those services. Um, the new report shows that for every dollar um, spent on education, and we just got this, the total impact in the community colleges have on the, on the U.S. economy is $809 billion, which is 5.4% of, of the gross domestic product. Uh, that's what they did on a national and what they show for every dollar now um, of the dollar of public invest, they'll reap a cumulative a value of six dollars and eighty cents per per dollar. Uh, we receive approximately forty four forty five <coughs> billion dollars of funding from the public sector, and yet community college generated three hundred five billion dollars into the um, taxpayers' benefits. So. Um, you can see that the value, I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but the value of the community college that we hold uh, in our area and in Macon County. Uh, this slide we talked about in December, the value of the community college, we are about two-thirds less the cost of the average university uh, tuition and fees. And then we jumped into the uh, master plan. And I may have hit the, I may have to pull up that other presentation. Um, what, where we're at right now is 
in the Groves building, which is this building right here. What we're looking at is on our master plan, and we've created a master plan that's about 30 years out. So about every eight years we need to expand, and the, and the expansion is, is right now and present from what uh, we have here at the Grove Center and at Public Safety and Training. <coughs> this building is a building uh, that is an educational science building that would help uh, provide those science classes, expand that we do not have here at the Macon campus. But that building would go directly out of this, uh, from this building and would be connected by a walkway. And that building is approximately the same size as this building, 35,000 square feet. What we, and then this building here is the public safety and, and training uh, building. What we found on the needs of the public safety and training complex is that that building is about 16,000 square feet right now and with programs that Curtis and they are looking at expanding to, they need an additional 35,000. So this building is probably is right at 50,000 square feet that would would uh, work toward all their classroom and their training and things and activities that they're not capable of uh, necessarily doing now, but it would provide uh, a greater opportunity. This building here is a indoor firing range. Um, and I can let Curtis speak to that also uh, in a minute. And this building is a, um, a station that would could house and could partner with the county for a fire truck EMS type uh, relay station. And you could have one here that could serve this area out here. Um, then eight years down the road or 10 years down the road, there's an extension again of the Macon County campus in the Groves uh, Center here. Another building that extends off the one that we had put out here and then you have an extension of the public safety and training. And then ultimately we would be looking at a third phase that would be adding to the public safety and training. Um, these phases, phase one we're looking at it helping and working for about eight to ten years. Phase two is another eight to ten years out. Phase three is another. So we've got about a 30-year uh, master plan here at this point. Now, ending in uh, the presentation in December, what we can see here, well, let's start with the yellow. The yellow is what we presently have that is property that we have available to the college to expand on. And you can see that that accommodates the growth center or the curriculum side of the house. The public safety side, we were looking at this, I'm, I'm gonna call it purple <coughs> line, and it goes up. This is property that as you look out behind you, off to the right, and goes out down the valley, because here's where the library is at. It just comes straight down. There's approximately 19 uh, plus or minus acres right here that would create the opportunity for Southwestern Community College and the Macon County uh, to create a campus in Macon County and consolidate those uh, programs on one, on one location. Uh, so. Curtis, is there anything that you would like to add from the standpoint of ex program expansion? The, uh, the one thing that, that we're having difficulties now with is the uh, practical requirements that we have to do scenarios in so many different disciplines to prepare our public safety professionals is that we don't have the space available to do that. So what we're doing is they'll be sitting in a classroom one minute and we're having to recreate that space into another venue for practical purposes and with the number of classes that we're running now <clears throat> that space is becoming we're, we're running into each other it, the building wasn't meant to, to do what we're, in, we're doing it right now we're just you know we're making the best we can with the space we've got available because we don't want to 
let land out also to the federal program that is coming down the pipe from the National Park Service as well. Um, the, going from a smaller building to a larger building, it allows us to have those scenario rooms readily available and then we can be able to combine our curriculum courses of criminal justice and paramedic program, bring that over to Macon County as well and, and fall under that one umbrella of public safety training and we can share resources at that time, simulation labs, and do a lot of different unique things together then too. Any questions? That wooded area, that dog lake to the left there, yes, sir. <coughs> uh, that's a beautiful little ridge down through there. Is that, is that part of your training area? We set up, um, for the National Park Service, we do woodland operations. Oh, okay. And, well, that's and then we do some campsite things as well because they're working in, so in the outdoor classroom. Yes, sir. We, we go up to uh, Arrowwood Lake sometimes. That makes the job corps do that. You know, we, we travel all around. We go up on the Hawaii to do woodland tracking and stuff like that. We get permits through the parks, Park Service or the Forest Service to do those things when we do that. So, uh, you know, we have a good working relationship with those folks, but having it readily available that cuts down on the travel time and lets us, uh, you know, conduct more training at that time, too. The one thing that we'll have to consider at some point is the uh, inclusion of the burn building for our firefighters as well, because our burn building now is uh, third, it's one of the oldest in the state still in operation as well. And with the new requirements that have set, been set forth by the Office of State Fire Marshal for the training of those firefighters, we're the only building, burn building west of Asheville that's approved for use to meet the new standard, because it has to be so many floors and so many square feet. So now we're getting everybody from uh, Murphy, Clay County, Graham County, and even Haywood County for coming over to use the burn building because the, they have to do so many hours of live burn each year. So that's really taxing that building out that's already 31 plus years old as well. So, and I spoke with Ms. Watson this evening about that, addressing that issue as well. So those are some other things that are coming down the pipe. <coughs> In the present site is out of the industrial site, as you all are aware, and um, there's really not any room to expand around that. We could build around the one building that we have right there, uh, but then we do a parking lot at the corner, uh, and it's all rock. But then what? You know, we're we're landlocked again right there, so. This provides a much more viable opportunity for expansion and future expansion down rather than building a building of that nature out of public safety and training right now and then all of a sudden 10 years later coming and saying we need additional space and then having it split uh, in two different locations. Be inside into the greenway because of all of our programs, physical requirements that allows us to do a lot of physical training a lot safer than than what we're running up and down Patton Valley now on the road and the four lane. So that's all public safety and training, and that's where the additional 19 plus or minus acres would um, outside of the boundary that we already presently have. Cheryl, would you like to speak to the curriculum side as far as the needs? Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, you know, anytime I get the two minutes that Dr. Thomas gives me to talk, I talk as fast as I can. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Um, <laughs> this is one of those situations that it's just good and it's good. There is no bad news here. Um, last fall, we talked the 500 head count here at our campus the first time in history. Um, from last fall to this fall, we increased in FTE, which is our state funding, and head count. Last spring to this spring, we did it again. As a matter of fact, our total number this spring, 477, was what our fall head count was in um, 2012. So, I mean, our spring numbers are getting close to what our fall numbers used to be. And you, you remember when you were in college, fall was a heavy semester, and spring it kind of dwindled off, and then summer, you know, that's when people took vacations. Well, now our springs are starting to look like our summer, so it's just a great situation. You know, in addition to that, we've got activities planned so that our students are getting a real post-secondary um, experience here. 
getting them involved in the community, blood drives, we've got a spring fling plan, um, a coffee house where students will be able to come, read their poetry, short stories, play some music, you know, one evening. You know, so really trying to engage those students not only in the classroom, but also extracurricular <coughs> activities. Well, um, you know, anytime you're doing something like this, you've got a plan. And the plan is that I wanted to make sure that I'm adding classes to the courses that we've already got offered. That I'm also adding any programs that I can from the Silver Campus here, and that we're being a good neighbor. In the summer, we've got an extra drawing class coming, so I'm hoping that I can draw some folks from MEC and also um, the uh, uh, AFA over here. But during the fall, what I'm trying to do is to tag on to those initial courses and specific programs and put in that second course. We'll be adding a conversational Spanish. That zoology course will come back, a new criminology course, a new the philosophy course. Um, I wish I had those buildings. <laughs> no, no, no thought about those <coughs> There's always that discussion that we're having, Tom. Dr. Brooks and I had that discussion the other day. Is, is, as we expand down here, what are we going to be able to bring down from vocational type um, uh, programs? As you know, we're, we have a health sciences on the Jackson campus. Yeah, we have welding uh, and then auto mechanics. We do auto mechanics here, but as far as plumbing, electrical, uh, those technical we don't have those anywhere. Is that why the SEC was based on them? It originally, uh, I think bricks and mortar and masonry and people um, who went to college there, I guess, they're about to retire now from that. Well, I got from masonry there back in 1940. Yeah. Uh, we do that for uh, some of the some of that training that we work with them. But that's not out here. And I, I know you know what's out of job for. But the issues of it showing, you know, you've got you know, electronics and things like that. Right. And the electrician was used in the program, wasn't it? In the nine minute that turned into a 50 minute video. Right. It was. It was one of the examples as an electrician. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Um, 50 minute, nine minute? I know. Uh, also adding some PE classes, um, running, jogging, walking, um, uh, self-defense, martial arts, and um, we're also going to have someone come down and teach an HSC 110 and orientation to health careers. So you can see I'm trying to diversify not only to build on some of the courses we've already got, but also to diversify you know, to attract some new students. In addition to that, we're also bringing down some new continuing ed classes. Last night we just finished a beginning sign language. Yoga is going on uh, downstairs right now. Getting paid to talk, a ton of real estate courses, digital photography. So I'm trying to be a good steward about the credit level courses that we've got going on during the daytime, but also bringing in some continuing education classes at night. Now, you've also got somebody like Tiffany Henry that does a great job with that small business center. And last night I had an opportunity to look at some of the projects they were presenting. You had 25 or 30 people that have been here for the entire series trying to figure out, you know, what's a good business plan? How am I going to put it together? How's it going to be successful? So, you know, does another perspective that's being added to the campus. And so, um, with that, I would say that we're trying to diversify where our students are. We're bringing in um, an opportunity for them to go to Costa Rica next spring so that they can experience that different culture. <coughs> and so we're really trying to open up or broaden the possibilities for a student that comes to our campus here. Bottom line is the college is committed to growing the college at making campus. It is. Um, in a conversation with Dr. Thomas today, he said, if the budget holds to form, I should be able to advertise for two full new um, instructors, one in math and a biology instructor, which is going to add you know, to um, what we've got here. Because when you think about who's here, I have one full-time instructor, 30 plus <coughs> adjuncts that work here. We've got three staff, one temporary, and two tutors. And so you'll have another person, another two people that are invested, you know, in growing this campus. Do you have Friday classes here? We do have some. Some. It looks awful, it looks awful dry on Friday. Uh, and you know what? Um, a post-secondary took a turn. You probably grew up the same time I did. You had Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes, and then Tuesday, Thursday classes. Yeah, and every now and then you'd have a class on Saturday, like a physics lab or something like that. 
Well, about five or seven years ago, they shifted to Monday, Wednesday classes and just Tuesday, Thursday is um, Bob Holt can come in and teach those real estate classes for us. MEC is able to use the, utilize the building for leadership and then they're also able to get into our labs downstairs, you know, put some real good use to those things. So we do try to take advantage of that. Um, bottom line, I'll have the same three commitments that I walked in this door with. One, I want to add to the number of courses that we're able to offer. <coughs> And grow the campus that way. Two, if I can bring in some additional programs, and I'm not saying they necessarily have to be different than what's going on over in Silver, just if I can bring some more of those down here. And third, if I can be a good neighbor. Those are the three things we're trying to do. And bottom line, um, we're doing a good job. Curtis's program, I mean, it's hats off to him all the time. And our numbers here, um, the only negative I got from Dr. Thomas today was but you haven't hit 500 head count in the spring yet. So I guess that's what's next on my target. And so, um, but I can tell you, I appreciate all the opportunities you provide us here. And we try to be good stewards. Thanks. It really wasn't a negative. You bragged on that 500. I was done saying how much you had grown in the spring. And I said, now, did you hit 500 in the spring yet? It's also like, I, I was expecting okay. you to say, absolutely, but... Uh, 477. 477, well, it, a year from now you'll be there. So, with that said, to condense the hour-long presentation down to nine-minute video, um, the request from us would be for consideration of the 19 plus or minus acres, and a memorandum of understanding that could be signed by the Macon County Commissioners, uh, Southwestern Community College, as first right of refusal for that property for future expansion. And that, that uh, request comes from your board? That request comes from uh, our board and our administration. What about the construction? I mean, do you have any idea about the money for you, Dr. Tom? Well, um, there's not anything at the state level at this particular point in time. But we have to prepare ourselves for when that does occur again, should it occur. Without having a plan or a master plan and having the ability, and all of a sudden uh, they release something <coughs> in a bond or funding, and all of a sudden we come back and we say, we don't have a place to build. We'd love to have $10 million. So right now, what we're trying to do is phase it into the planning phase. First things first, secure or at least have a uh, security of property. If that should happen in the future, then we can come in and um, we'll be ready to go. We won't have to worry about asking for the property and going through maybe a six month or longer process. So to summarize, you. This, this property with, with purple is currently owned by the county. Correct. And what you're asking for is not for us to deed it to you at this point. You're asking for us to give you first right of refusal in the future, in the future for expansion and creating a <coughs> campus. And, a, and would that be would that be good enough, Terry, uh, to to uh, seek any state funding should that become available? the first try of fusion would be I would, as good as I would think so because at that point in time then we would probably have to come back and depending on the funding and how we would do the financing we'd have to have it needed over then probably at that point in time. And, and, and building however you may, may do it, it may be in the county, it may be in the time of the county to, to the community college to be, I don't know. Right. Okay. Major questions? Comments. The property line at the library that we talked about, Dr. Thomas. Yes, sir. To the left. Yes. Was that moved? Yes. This 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 was moved because originally Commission Bill, we I believe we uh, came off this point and then came down. And it, your request when we looked at it originally, we did not want to uh, uh, obstruct any growth. growth coming up with a parking lot. For expansion of the library. So we have 30 years from now, uh, the county wanted to expand that. 
the library, that would be the natural place for that. It would go, yes. It goes, yes. Go it goes, yeah. it goes out that way. Okay. Would we need a survey, do you think? Mm -hmm. you, did, you, did, they you have it. a partial survey, Mr. Sprinkle and I uh, communicated during this process, and you do have some, some, uh, you would need some additional survey, yes. Sir. Yeah, probably official survey at the time of, you know, construction or needing it over, but I think right now it's pretty fairly accurate. I would also like to add that the Community College of Southwestern has done a complete archaeological study. And on all the, on every site that they had intentions on putting a building on or disturbing, and it came back clean as a whistle. There were no artifacts discovered in hundreds of holes dug, and you can see that some bottle caps from a piece of a bridge right over there. I've never seen <laughs> it. <laughs> Uh, you read that, did you? That was a lot of it, it was a history lesson for me. It I don't was. care about brick making, but I know about it now. But they didn't find any Cherokee yeah. artifacts in any of them. It's not a very You're a bit of I have no problem with that. I think that, in my opinion, is probably the highest and best use for that property. Uh, and I have thought for you, I mean, Having Southwestern Community College here is such an asset to our community and to our young folks. And, uh, I've got Nobbins testing for that. So he's pretends here and uh, hoping to get it. Yeah. You occupational like therapy with another program he's hoping to go So I so very much believe in, in that first instance. It offered a much lower cost education uh, than, than the university. So, and, and with that said, if, if Southwestern is going to expand in Bacon County, this would be the logical place to do it. Uh, so I would be for, for uh, looking at it. I think we need to, to uh, we need to put some type of uh, uh, time limit on. We can't make it open-ended forever. Right. You know, uh, maybe have Chester yes. look, draft something for us to consider Chester. I think basically what we'd be looking at is a first part of refusal. I think they're yeah. looking for something that would accommodate a 30-year plan. Uh, obviously, I think the county would like to see <coughs> things happen sooner rather than later. Right. And, and I, we may just need to talk further about those specifics. Let, let me just ask, we're, we're not, I mean, obviously we don't have a proposal to vote on, but I sure. think the consensus of the board is that we have a general consensus that we would consider this uh, if, if general. Brought that to us, Ronnie. Oh yeah, I think I think there's no doubt. Yeah. I think sure. we, you have a consensus board that, that we're we're in favor of this. Uh, I do think there's some questions about because boards change in ten years, people right. change, right. and I think they need to be something solidified on the points of of designation on the map. Now, you might go back to an old deed and, and get the calls off of that without having to pay for a survey, but uh, <coughs> yeah, I think there are a number of considerations that would need to be addressed in any sort of first right of, of refusal, including but not limited to what sort of commitments that the community college would be making in return for it. Uh, yeah. And those things would need to be I think uh, a part and parcel of the first right of refusal. Well, then what's your anticipation? Uh, First, I know the state funding's not available, but would you say your goal would be to begin <coughs> phase one within two years, within five years, within what? Or sooner if the money was there, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Um, this would be great. I mean, we're, we've already outgrown this space, uh, Cheryl's, with her classes. Um, in, you've had workforce solutions in here. Many of the community colleges have workforce solutions on their campuses because they work in that partnership. And what's, so not, a, what's not been said is that this campus had zero students uh, before. So, you know, right, it's what, 97? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. 97, yeah. 90, yeah, 15 yeah. years ago. Right, there were zero students here. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll uh, tell you what, I'd love to see something started on that because it's like you was talking about having electrician training courses and all these other vocational things would sure be great out here for a long time. It's coming back. Yep. Well, it's there's no left. left. I mean, I'll tell you any of the business that is in the construction business. <coughs> all the people we use are retiring. 
the raising it. And you can't come the, yeah. the younger generations, I hope some of them fixed it. But, uh, well, I think from that video, we did an excellent job as a society telling everyone you have to go to college. Yeah. And, we, and we made the point of four-year institution. 2002 2 or something like that. They yeah. did a, they did a, a statewide uh, funding that's from Western Carolina got uh, their oh performing the arts building yeah. and all that. So the state on yeah. occasion does that. The last last state funding that came out was probably 2002 or three. Yeah, yeah. Two, two to four. And I know that that's what everybody's hitting the GA or General Assembly for right now is, is buildings and facilities again. So, and with that, with that said, we're hopeful that something will come. We talk about a quote price, and, and I think Ron is right. I, I can't imagine, certainly as a current board, and I really can't imagine a future board commissioners that would say, okay, we're going to sell this property to an industry or to for a, for any other purpose. Uh, so it would. I think that the, the plan is and has been for, for this to be used by Southwest Community College. So would there be an objection to as we, as we write this, perhaps making it a gift uh, at that time to be used, as you say, potentially for some matching money, the value of the property, the, the market value of the property could be used as, as a match. That would be the, the, that would be the family's but contribution then. It would be bad you to get that match. Right. Which you would do out of you give it as a gift or whatever. Right. Yeah. So would, is that something we'd be open to? Well, we'd like to see tied up for some of the mm -hmm. up. Yeah, that's exactly what was going through my mind as we're sitting here talking. Mm -hmm. Not sure that the option is necessarily the best. Um, is that the not, that's the first part refusal may not be the best. That's not going to do what we want. But, but what I would encourage you to do is authorize me to, to uh, <coughs> meet with Dr. Thomas and maybe just a little bit of brainstorming about what sort of an agreement could be structured that would meet their needs and, and would also meet counties. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. hard With the idea that in a sense you're, you're sort of making a commitment to set this property aside for these uses that have been presented and likewise a commitment that those uses in fact could be fruition. Judge, I'm, I'm watching by language or board members here. I think that's a general consensus that we'd like you to do that. So. Won't you yeah. get with Dr. Thomas and discuss the details and bring that back to us at the future board meeting? Correct. Okay. We'll do that. I think every one of us sitting here would like to see something like that here. Yeah. Yeah. I always wanted the money free now. Yeah. I did too. I did too. I guess the day Commissioner Tate could grow one. That's a lot of unusual questions. That's all right. I, I didn't always have the answer. Give me an unusual answer. Okay. I was going to say that. that what is the future public library? That's yeah, and, and I couldn't I, I couldn't answer that one. Yeah, yeah. Said you're what it, the last last research I've seen on that because everything going to electronics, there's kind of a shift now that people are actually going back to paper and doing that. But that's an asset to us as far as public library. That's always going to be a need for a, a college setting right. because of research and that. And, and even though you know, we do EMS and we do law enforcement. We still have that research need because our training is based on that research. <coughs> here, so well, yeah, having it there is just a value. We have a lot of Correct. But our library, our library just had to be leads on the library, so I can speak to the library. Yeah. 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 Our library, we yeah. uh, yeah. have a yeah. library yeah. system. Yeah. I think we saw, and uh, if we can get the numbers exactly, but it was well in excess of. Of our library. So, the library was still very useful. Hudson Library in Highlands. And Swain County just expanded their library and built a new library. So, uh, library is a good stuff. Yeah, and Southern Association of Accreditation, which is our regional accrediting body, this has been acknowledged as a campus and it wouldn't have been acknowledged without that library. Because as part of the accrediting process, you have to have, have a library. that have to have that library available in order to have a campus designation. Yeah. In the so, so, so down there's the still road, that partnership. Yeah. Somewhere down the road, that might even be. I mean, still be. Oh, I mean, oh yeah, yes, yes. I, I think it's I understand where you're going with that. Yes, it's it's an absolute perfect storm. It's going to be an island. It's, be an island. it's, it's a perfect storm because you got early college on one side, you got the library, and then 
it basically says you're, you're holding that piece of property aside for the community college to purchase at a given price. Um, and set pay within that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Oh no, he just triggered the sale. What he's looking for is some way to call the first right of refusal. And then even into that week, well, there, there would be no way to call it unless and until somebody made an offer. First right of refusal. Yes, if the county was the only one could act on selling the property, but even like you said, if we just get over a first round of refusal and we never decide to sell it, whatever he's holding is worth nothing. It's absolutely yeah. worth nothing. We need some yeah. sort of reverse trigger or something so that if he does get funding, they could make an offer. Then he could he could ask the county to and I think that that could potentially come about in the form of an option to purchase. Uh, and we would just need to sit down and figure out the terms that would be acceptable to them and then terms and protections that the county would need as well. And the, then the sale price is, just, is, is included in an option. I mean, yeah. I, you, don't give, you, can set, you can set the sale price. Indeed, you could, you know, we don't know whether that would happen today or tomorrow or 10 years from now. You, but if he has an you, option, he wants to call it and there's no set price. Two boards from there and say, hey, well, $40 million. Well, I, in, in, in that event, we're going to have to be careful and creative on how that yeah. option price is established. It could be it could be done. One typical way that is often done is, is that there would be uh, a couple of appraisals done at, at the time the option is exercised. There's any of a number of ways that it could be done. You could set it. Uh, you could set a price if exercised today, and then you could add an inflator to it. Uh, any of a number of things, and that's just a product of further discussions, I think, with with leadership. Jerry or somebody that remember how this property was handled before we're sitting down? It was uh, the ready, ready was a gift. A gift from the county. Yeah, it was needed from the county to the college. Yeah. And I think mean this college is. Uh, as Ronnie said, we're losing out on our trades, our vocation. I graduated Silva in 1968. Uh, Tried to So I went over to college. Now I run tobacco for a living, but education doesn't work. No, it does. And, I, and I, I mean, I'm with Ronnie. We've got that. this hands on technical training, is, we're just losing it. And, I mean, that has nothing to do with what you're presenting here tonight, but no, <coughs> the board, I think, and, and I would hope that the future board would be supportive of this level of education. Uh, and, and we appreciate the support that we have received from you all uh, today, uh, and we continue to, as Cheryl said, we want to do the, the right thing for the right reason, and that's to help educate and, and provide the services necessary to make them so. Totally. You're going to bring something back, Chester, that says and some options for us to look at. It. Yeah, I, I think probably what we need to do first is just get some very basic documents for discussion purposes. And I guess I need a point of contact with the uh, with the oh. school. Oh. Uh, <laughs> will, will you be the point of contact? <laughs> okay. And it's because basically what I want to do is try to present some documents that we uh, feel fairly comfortable with school can can live with and documents that we feel fairly comfortable with the county. But the only two people really be interested in this property is the county and the school, correct? I mean, let's just be honest. That's the only two entities that I think the county would ever recognize because this the school is here and it wants to expand here. So, Well, I, I, I think basically, I, if my understanding is correctly, the idea that this was purchased with the idea that it would be for educational purposes. And, yeah. I think we ought to be perfectly honest with you. And I may not be here. We're looking for another gift. And, 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 and from that standpoint, the first right of refusal is, uh, you know, somewhat, it may not be the right term for it. If, if really what you're looking at is, is, is a gift, then the option might not be the right term. Looking for well, yeah, that, you put a value on it, we want you to sacrifice that value and say this to you. <laughs> I've never had to sit through one of these meetings before, and it's not to do that. 
you know, this is a good plan. I mean, it's detailed, but it's lacking the financial arrangement thing, right. which you explained, you don't know what that's going to cost us. How's funding generally done as you get past the land and acquisition of all that? Uh, how do you build these? How do you build colleges? Well, you know, the state will come out with bonds and then we can, uh, they'll release money that we'll be able to ask for on that. Um, there are county support. There's local support for counties that uh, have money that they put monies into. They have match monies. Uh, the gift of the land can be used as part of that match money that we can draw down from the state. I think the growth building here was bought or bought was built that way. I think there was like $3 million uh, that was brought down here to build the Groves building. Um, there's um, other sources.